Um, we're quite honored this morning to have members of our K-State's Powercat Motorsports team with us this morning. Powercat Motorsports is K-State Society of Automotive Engineers Formula Race Team. Formula SAE is the world's largest and most prestigious design competition with 13 international competitions and over 700 active teams. Powercat Motorsports is proud to have represented K-State in this competition every year since 1997. The premise of this design series is to design, manufacture, test, race, and present a fully functional open wheel, open cockpit race car. While housed in the mechanical and nuclear engineering department, the entirety of the work is completed by students from all across campus. Powercat Motorsports has a proud tradition of hard work, dedicated ethics, and pushing the limits in design. This can be easily recognized as the team features advanced technologies that compare it to professional race teams. These include a full carbon fiber chassis, full, aerodyna full aerodynamic packages, custom CNC parts, a pneumatic paddle shift system, and wireless data acquisition to monitor the car's dynamic behavior in real time. Since there's so many of our members that have joined, or the members that have joined us this morning, I want to have uh, their president, Anish, uh, introduce everybody uh, this morning. But before he does, let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you, Doug, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Anish Shravastav. I'm the current president of Powercat Motorsports this year. Uh, just a little bit about our team and our structure. We have eight different subsystems plus a chief engineer in our team. So we start out with the aerodynamics team, business subsystem, chassis subsystem, drivetrain, electrical engine, ergo, and suspension. So our car's whole design, manufacturing, is all broken down into these individual groups. So first off, what is Formula SAE? Formula SAE is the Formula Society of Automotive Engineering. It is a collegiate design series event hosted by the SAE uh, International Organization. There is 700 plus internal combustion teams all over the world. There is 41 different countries represented in our competition across 14 competitions. Uh, the whole idea of Formula SAE is to focus on teaching the design, build, test process, and we do that by demonstrating and validating a formula style race car every year. And I'm going to pass it to Joe. Hey, so my name is Joe Straub. I'm the chief engineer for this year. Um, so each year we compete in at least one FC competition. So this year we'll be at the Michigan International Speedway. Uh, May 8th to May 11th and we'll be one of 120 teams competing in the internal combustion engine class for this, that competition. We also participate in some local SCCA competitions occasionally such as that in Salina and this year we actually hosted our first competition. It was kind of a mini style FCE competition here in Manhattan with eight teams from the Midwest had teams like KU and Wichita State participate and we actually took home first place for that one. So to compete in an FC competition, uh, the car must fully comply with a pretty extensive rule book. Um, upon arriving at competition, we'll go through a series of safety and technical inspections. Um, so the car will be fully gone through to verify it's uh, fully compliant with the 138 page rule book. Um, as well, there are some dynamic tech, of, uh, tech events that we have to pass. Uh, pictured here is a fuel tilt test. So the car is actually placed on a platform that is then rotated up to 60 degrees uh, to verify that there's no fluid liquids and also to ensure that the center of gravity of the car is low enough that rolling over isn't a concern. Um, next, there's a noise requirement. We must be under 103 decibels at idle speed and under 110 decibels at a, a pre-designated RPM for our engine. Um, there's also a brakes um, tech inspection. We have to reach a speed of around 30 miles an hour and simultaneously lock up all four wheels. And upon passing all these technical inspections, we're allowed to compete. So the competition itself is broken down into static and dynamic events. Um, for the static events, we have a business presentation, a design, uh, a design event where we have um, judges from across the industry um, verify and, and uh, inquire about our design for this year. Uh, we have a cost analysis event. And then for dynamic events, we have an acceleration event, the 75 meters, a skid pad, autocross, and endurance. And as you can see by the point breakdown, the endurance event, which is a 22 kilometer <laughs> race with uh, driver chains in the middle, that is our biggest event. So some teams we compete against, uh, 
some of them that you may recognize, the UIC, they're all sponsored by companies such as like Porsche, Fiat Chrysler, Stellantis, Borg Warner, Goodyear, and a lot of other automotive name brands. And then our alumni, where we go after we learn all our stuff here, is a lot of our alumni go to Spirit Air Systems, Alltech, Fiat Chrysler, Garmin, Philips 66, and that list goes on and on. And most of those are major sponsors of the Formula SAE team. Um, so some general team goals and highlights uh, for this year. Um, the goal is to have the car full wet weight under 475 pounds. Um, we want to complete three mock endurances in order to prepare for competition. Uh, manufacture the chassis over winter break, which we have completed a few weeks ago. And then to have the car finished by April 6th, which is actually the date of an all-university open house. And so we're hoping to unveil the new car on that date. Um, some highlights, uh, design highlights for this year is an, it will be an updated aero package. Uh, the chassis layup had a full revamp, engine weight reduction, improved ergonomics, and refined suspension tuning. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tyler Weber. I am the aerodynamics lead um, for the Powercat Motorsports team. Um, so as aerodynamics lead, I'm responsible for all of the aerodynamic components on the car, and that includes the front wing assembly, the rear wing assembly, the side pods, and the under tray. And Obviously, that comes with um, designing it and then testing it, manufacturing, all that type of stuff. Um, so beginning with um, designing our aerodynamics package, we designed the entire aerodynamics package in SOLIDWORKS. Um, and then after we designed it in SOLIDWORKS, we tested the entire package using flow simulations, including SOLIDWORKS, CFD, and on ANSYS. And then after we manufactured the entire package, we validated it in real life using um, like string testing and then also like shock pot numbers, things like that, just to verify you know, how efficient we were in terms of our manufacturing and comparing that with our design goals. To actually manufacture our aerodynamics package, uh, for this one specifically, we, we used a wet lay carbon fiber manufacturing practice. Um, and most of the components are just carbon fiber um, with some, some of them have Kevlar reinforcements and then other components like the under tray, we reinforced with core to make them stiffer make them lighter, and just make them stronger in general. Um, to lay up our wing element, like the wing elements, the under tray and side pods, we use a combination of MDF molds, um, uh, aluminum sheet panels, as well as um, uh, high density foam molds. Uh, we coat them, we spray them, and then we lay up carbon on top of them. And then we actually vacuum bag them and pull resin to actually cure the parts. And that, that's pretty time consuming. We do about, well, this car had about 18 um, parts that we did. So that was like a total of, yeah, eight, 18 vacuum bag layups. And we were able to complete that, um, obviously, in this semester. That's all I have. I'll hand it off to our chassis lead. Well, howdy there. My name is Peyton Lee. I am the chassis lead. And I cover essentially one big system. It is the monocoque. Relative to all the other systems on the chassis, it's pretty simple because it's essentially one big part. Um, and the big thing that we really focus on is our composite development and our composite layout. So rather than manufacturing the chassis over the second semester, the chassis is more like the foundation of the building. You have to get it done first because all of the car is built around it. So all of our design work and all of our manufacturing and testing work gets done during the first semester and that is pretty much the primary focus of the chassis system so that the rest of the car can be built after starting right now. So relative to this car compared to this year, so in 2022 when this car was built, the chassis weighed around 52 pounds. The car that we built this year was 51 pounds. That doesn't seem like much of a drop, except that this chassis actually had some big failures. We actually ripped the suspension out of the bottom of the chassis because the design loads were not correctly done and we tested it and the very first time we drove it, it pulled suspension mounts through the bottom of the chassis. So if you take a look inside of it, you can take a gander inside of the chassis. There's a really big aluminum plate inside of there and we had to add, I think about six or seven pounds worth of reinforcements and redo several of the layups on the inside of the chassis to reinforce that area. So that's one of the big things that we focused on throughout the past two years. Last year, the chassis weighed 56 pounds using the same load cases and a better understanding of the rules, we were able to chop five pounds out of the same exact monocoque design just by understanding the rules and the load cases better. So it is constructed of 
carbon fiber and a honeycomb matrix. We have to test all of our layups. Uh, there's a big document called the SES. It's the Structural Equivalency Spreadsheet. SAE makes this spreadsheet because they want to ensure that the car is safe and structurally sound when we go to competition. If there's an accident, they want to make sure that, granted, we are all college students, so they want to protect us from ourselves as well as the other obstacles on the course. So what we do is we lay up several different composite test panels. There are several different regions of various impact resistance in the chassis. We have to make test panels to show that those are equivalent to what's in the rules and it's compared against their results from equivalent steel tube structure tests. So we make the chassis over winter break. We get the whole team together, the whole crew, about 15, 20 of us. We all spend one week. Um, the carbon only has an out life of nine days. So once we start, we can't stop and we grind it out for nine days straight, ideally less than that. Um, and take the chassis out to Wichita State, where Wichita State, who's a big supporter of the team, at least their NIAR NCAT facility, which is uh, their tech training facility for all of aerospace industry and engineers. Um, they have an autoclave there, well, several, and they actually cure our chassis. The autoclave, if any of you know what a pressure cooker is, yeah. it's essentially like that, but it gets really hot and puts a lot, about 45 PSI on the chassis and it compresses all of the layups together and it makes our chassis into one big piece. And on the left there, you can see all of the different layup regions for this specific chassis. So we run about, it's really four main layups. There's a front bulkhead support, the front bulkhead, the side impact structure, as well as some other minor layups that are less structurally impact. The front bulkhead is the biggest layup. There's about 20 total layers of carbon fiber and the core inside of it is around 16 pounds per cubic inch, or cubic foot. So we take a lot of load. The chassis are really over-designed so that they're safe, and that is essentially all of the chassis subsystem. Uh, so my name is Weston Pellet. I'm the drivetrain lead, and I'll be talking a little bit about the drivetrain subsystem. So uh, highlighted in blue on the left, is the drivetrain off the car. Basically, the drivetrain is responsible for getting the power from the engine to the wheels um, through the differential, which is pictured on the right. Uh, pretty much the whole subsystem is built around the differential. Um, so pictured on the right is a modeled assembly of the drivetrain subsystem by itself. Some major comp components are the chain that hook up to the sprocket right off the transmission, and then the differential pictured here, um, and then the half shafts, stub shafts, uh, the half shafts, and then the stub shafts, the drive hubs, um, and then the carriers, which mount off the engine, the differential carriers. And so this is the differential that the whole drivetrain subsystem is built around. It's a Torsen T1 limited slip differential, and we pulled it out of a early 2000s manual Audi um, and then we custom make our own housing to make it lighter and um, keep all of the oil sealed. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much all of the drivetrain subsystem. Um, I'll be handing it off to Electrol. Thank you. All right, cool. Uh, my name is Will Fulkerson, and I'm the electrical sub team lead. Um, so there's a couple major components in the electrical system that we can place right away. Uh, obviously, the ECU, which controls all of our engine. Everything is electronically fuel injected. Our ignition's all controlled, and it's all tuned through the engine control unit. Um, this car uses a MoTeC M130, but we've recently switched to a Haltech ECU, and we're switching even more recently to an ECU from an Australian company called EMTRON. Um, so we're going to see how that works out this season. We also have um, a dash, which we call the DAC, because it does data acquisition for us. So anything that the ECU collects via data, and it logs all of that, anything that the ECU doesn't get is pretty much sent to the dash, and that collects a bunch of data for us as well. Almost anything you can imagine that we would measure via sensors, we do. Whether that's suspension travel, coolant temperature in two or three different places, depending on the year, you know, 
uh, oil pressure, oil temperature, anything like that. It's all measured and we'll have to log all of it because that data is super valuable for us in developing future cars. Also, the dash, of course, gives a lot of critical information to the driver. You know, gear position and engine RPM speed, that kind of stuff. The really beating heart of the electrical system, though, is the harness that connects everything together. Um, it's obviously pretty simple compared to a full automotive engine, um, harness, but it's you know still fairly in-depth project to build. To design the harness, we first lay everything up in a program called Rapid Harness. It's a computer-aided design software where you can put in connectors and components and everything and run wiring and then design how the harness is going to look virtually so that when it's time to build the harness, you can export all of those wires and just say, okay, I need a purple wire that's 13 centimeters long and then just put it where it goes. I need a red wire that's 40 centimeters long and put it where it goes. And it makes it so much easier to build everything if you can lay it all up in the computer first. The wiring harness is about half of the battle for the electrical subsystem. I would say the other half of the battle is actually tuning the engine, which is my other major responsibility. Um, to tune the engine, this car was tuned um, just by driving it. It was like street tuned, if you want to call it that. Right now, we actually have a dyno that we use for tuning, or are attempting to use for tuning, where we can put the engine on a stand and hook it up to a load brake and we can run the engine in the shop and actually look at how it's performing, how much horsepower and torque it's making, and tune everything from fuel and ignition timing to injector timing. Pretty much anything you can imagine these ECUs can do. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good overview of electrical. Good morning. My name is Thomas Harp. I'm the engine subsystem lead for this year. So as you can imagine, the engine is a very important system, as they all are, to the performance of the vehicle. While it is, well, you do use motorcycle engines, which are st pretty powerful from the factory. They do have a few but major restrictions. So first, the responsibilities of designing the engine system is choosing an engine and its internal components. So we have a wide variety to select from, from different um, engine manufacturers and then different models within those manufacturers. But in addition to that, you have all the auxiliary components of making an engine run. So the intake, the exhaust, the fuel system. Um, so a custom dry sum oil system, because these are formula cars, lots of tight churns, so lots of oil loss possibly. So that's why we have to run an external dry sum. Um, designing the cooling system, tuning the engine, as Will mentioned, then also all the other components that run the engine that are a little smaller. So this engine in this car was a Triumph Street Triple. It's an inline three cylinder. From the factory, it makes about 120 horsepower, but with the restrictions, it drops it down to about 89, is what we can make back out from that, and 59 foot-pounds of torque. So the key features with this is it's a street triple block, but we take a head off a of Triumph Daytona, which is a slightly higher performance version of the same engine, and put it on to this car. Um, so the stock engine has ITBs, individual throttle bodies, that are pretty much open air, but one of the major rule restrictions in SAE is a 19 millimeter restrictor, which is about the size of a, a penny. And so you're pulling from pretty much infinite air to a very small amount of air really quickly. And so the intake is hopefully designed to help maximize uh, the, minimize the, the losses from restricting down that much air. And so it's a carbon fiber 3D printed intake, 3D printed intake mold, and we lay up carbon fiber over that to make it as light as possible. Um, titanium exhaust system. As you can see in the picture, it's all pie cuts that are cut and then welded together to make the shape of the exhaust. So we don't do any bending. Um, external dry sump oil system. And so we build a custom oil sump um, pump that goes in the bottom of the block, but then we run an external sump tank on the side of the car. Um, we also run ethanol E85 fuel. Um, in SAE, there's three fuels you can run, E85, 100, and I think, what, 90, 98, 93. 93. Uh, but we run E85 because that um, allows for higher compression um, pistons, which we do run. And then the MoTeC ECU on this engine. Um, so the major restrictions with the, these engines are they're limited to 710 cc's, and so this engine's 675, so it's well within, well within that limit. Um, E85, when you're pulling through the 19 millimeter restrictor, if we were to run gasoline, it's a little bit bigger, but it's, it's pretty minimal. Um, one of the restrictions that you don't really think about would be that big of a deal, but actually is, is sound. And so 103 decibels at idle isn't too terribly loud, but 110 decibels is quite a bit louder because of the way the, the scaling happens with that, the decibel 
in scale. So with this engine, it has to be under 110 decibels at 8700 RPM, which is actually pretty loud, but it's when you design an exhaust system, getting well within that sound limit can actually reduce a lot of power. So you get to kind of minimize your losses when it comes, of, when it comes to terms of maintaining power as well as staying within the sound. And so that's pretty much all I have for engine. I'll hand it off to Ergo. Hi, I'm Peter Sagan. I'm the ergonomics lead for this year. So Ergo is basically everything the driver touches. So it's the pedals, the steering wheel, clutch handle, the seat, everything that holds you in the car. Uh, because these cars can pull up to like 2G. So it's pretty important to make sure the driver's held in there. You're not getting thrown around side to side. Uh, make sure you're comfortable. Uh, so like at competition, like we go through a design event uh, and the judge for our car last year said we had one of the most comfortable cars out of any of the cars he sat in, so proud for that. We've had people sleep in our cars, so it's important that they're comfortable because it increases, increases driver confidence, you know, make sure, make sure they're good. Um, so this is a picture of some of our steering wheel assembly. You can kind of look at it closer after this. Um, but we have a full carbon fiber steering wheel, and then we have uh, basically everything's custom. So we have custom machined pedals, uh, throttle pedal on the left, brake pedal on the right. It'd be a little weird if it was other than that, you know. But uh, yeah, it's all about just making sure they're intuitive and uh, the drivers feel comfortable controlling them. Uh, we go through a lot of design on having them try different things. So like with the throttle pedal, how much throw they want, if they want an on-off switch, or if they want, you know, a huge throw, just kind of depends on driver preference. Uh, we have a custom molded seat that's a bead seat, which is a lot of like what they use in professional racing with NASCAR and F1. Uh, so very similar stuff with all that. And then we have a, uh, Ergo is also responsible for all of the brakes and the shifting. Uh, so we have uh, four discs all the way around, you know, uh, and then uh, the pneumatic shifter is pretty cool. So you just, it's like a video game. You have the paddles, you know, upshift, downshift on the wheel, uh, and it's it works pretty good. Uh, makes it go nice and fast. And I'll hand it off to the suspension. So hello everyone. My name is Wyatt Haug. I'm the suspension lead for Powercat Motorsports. So per the rules, we're required at least two inches of suspension travel. Um, the overview of the suspension is that we're trying to make the car uh, have as much grip as possible, ha inspire as much confidence in the driver as possible. You know, they turn the wheel, it's actually going to turn where they want it to go. Um, on these cars, we run fully independent double wishbone suspension on all four corners um, with push rod actuated springs and dampers, similar to how like an Indy car or a F1 car would be. Um, so. Here's kind of a CAD drawing of the, all the suspension components. Um, pretty much everything you see on here, aside from the tires and the wheel shells, we make um, in-house. So all of the A-arms, push rods, um, bell cranks, tabs, uh, I guess also the dampers and springs we don't make. Um, but pretty much everything we make, we have jigs that we weld the A-arms on. Um, we have a CNC that we machine all of the bell cranks for. Um, so just kind of to point out some stuff. So you have push rods which actuate the spring and damper. You have the bell crank which is basically like the intermediate to actuate the spring and damper. Uh, you have uprights which are what all the control arms attach to and then what also uh, holds your bearings for your hubs and then your wheel attaches onto the hubs. Um, all of our mounting tabs all over the car. Um, you have our control arms themselves, dampers, steering rack, and then tie rods. So to start off with the design of the suspension, we start off with a software called Lotus Shark. It's made by Lotus. Um, it's just a suspension kinematics modeling software. Uh, you define where all of these A-arms points are, and then it'll spit out graphs of like, what your uh, roll center height is, what camber curves you have, what kind of bump steer toe curves you have. Um, and we place these points based on um, some constraints that the rules have. So for example, in the front, you have like a front cross section template where, you know, where your legs are. So that has to be, you know, a minimum width of what those upper A-arm uh, points can be. So we kind of base it around that 
and then also base it around what tire we decide. There's a few different tires that um, you can pick from. There's a, there's not a, a two to I would say there's probably about ten or so different uh, compounds and sizes that you could choose from, just because of the limitations of the size. So once we choose our tire and once we figure out where we want our kinematics to be, we move into our manufacturing. So we then uh, CNC uh, uprights, uh, bell cranks, tabs, um, and then also use, like I was saying before, our jigs. So we have jigs that just have holes drilled in them. And then you bolt the A-arm you know, down to that jig, weld them up, and then bolt them on the car. That's pretty much suspension. So. I'll turn it back over to Nish to finish it off. Thank you for letting us ramble on about our experience here on Formula SAE. So you can follow us on social media, Powercat Motorsports on Instagram or Facebook. And then, more importantly, does anyone have any questions? Sir? Where do you do your dynamic testing and racing? So we, Army, the Army Corps of Engineers lets us use the Tuttle Creek Spillway for all our dynamic testing. So we're really thankful to them for being a sponsor, and that's where we do all our dynamic testing. If, if, the, if the displacement on the engine restriction is 710 cc's, why did you go to 675? Why not put in the biggest engine you can? Um, so as far as engines, I think you're limited to uh, different manufacturers and different models. So like um, they make, I think, like the R7s are, like the Yamaha R7s are closer to 700, but when you're determining your engine, displacement isn't the only factor. So we picked the Daytona because three cylinders, so bigger cylinders, there's a lot more low end torque. And so while it may be a little bit less powerful or a little bit smaller than like a Yamaha RS7, it has a lot more lower end torque, which gives us uh, better benefits when actually driving the car. So there's a lot more to think about other than just the displacement, but it is still an important factor because I know a lot of teams, they do run really small engines, but they're also really light. And so that allows for the car to be very faster on corners because it's, you're not having to move that as much momentum around the corners. And so it's really when you're determining your, your design philosophies, it's kind of deciding how you want to approach the, the design of the car. And the engine falls pretty closely into that. So. When did the school start this Formula A program? Our team was founded in 1997, but then we didn't get our first car till competition till 1999. Because it's a college-based course, how often do you need to really get top speed on any uh, straight wings? <coughs> so we run on autocross style places, uh, and they usually be tight and technical. So there's a lot of headpins and stuff. I think the maximum straight is like, I don't know, like, uh, like 80. Yeah, like we probably like the maximum I think we've ever gotten these cars up to is like 80 miles an hour. So that's kind of what we design all the beginning and stuff around. Uh, in theory, these cars could go a lot faster than that, um, but they just never see that because of what kind of racing we do. They try to keep the speeds down because pretty much, danger. yeah, like like Thomas just said, danger, uh, because we're, we're a bunch of schmuck college students. Uh, there's, there's a couple teams with professional drivers, but most teams just have college students that you know love what we do and build the cars uh, that don't really have any racing experience. So. They try to keep the speeds down, so so we don't all die. <laughs> How many drivers do you have there? We have four drivers, but I'm going to let our main competition driver talk about that. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm uh, the main driver currently. Uh, so every year we do a driver shootout, um, and basically anyone that's put time in gets to drive the car and put down some lap times and then whoever's fastest drives the car. So there's two main autocross drivers that do the left to right turning and everything uh, for autocross and endurance. So endurance is a uh, two driver stint. It's a 10 kilometer race uh, with each driver does a five kilometer stint. Uh, and then autocross is a two lap, like you get one lap, well you get two laps, one lap go uh, to, uh, you know, it's just the best time. And then the other two drivers do skid pad and excel. So excel is a 75 meter drag race. And then skid pad is a figure eight, test like the suspension and how fast you can go around a corner. So four drivers in total, two of them do excel and skid pad and one power cross in advance. 
Do you notice the guy responsible for the comfort of the, of the car is also the main driver? <laughs> Sir? How, how have you done in competitions? Say that one more time. How did you guys play? We currently rank 14th in, all, in the United States as of last year, and then this year we're going to be top 10 for sure. <laughs> which is the first time we've ever broken the top 25 barrier in the last like 10 years. Sir? So how much of the car that you're working on right now is new build and how much is reused from this car or other car? So we build a new car every single year. So a typical cycle is we'll use a fall semester for design and then spring for manufacturing, testing and competing. Um, so these cars are often kind of the evolution of the, the previous car. Um, oftentimes we'll reuse the same chassis mold, um, but every year we do pretty significant design updates. Um, as I spoke about earlier, uh, there we have aerodynamic updates for this year, um, engine, every, pretty much every subsystem is reanalyzed and, and optimized. Um, but new car every year, typically design fall, manufacture in the spring. So. Is there a minimum weight that you have to have? No, there's no minimum weight. Yeah. There are there are some rules with that. Um, <clears throat> so you can't just build a super tiny car and have the smallest person possible drive it. Um, as part of the rule book and the technical inspections, they'll verify that the car can fit a five percent female up to a ninety-five percent male. Um, I don't know was that six three or something. Six foot ten to six foot two. Okay, to six foot two. Um, so there are some stipulations with that uh, regarding sizing, um, but no minimum weight. So. How, how many students in the college are involved? Which fewer or more? So we start out each year with like 100, and then by week two, it's down to like 20. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, it's a really, really large time commitment. Everyone, the polos you see, spend at least 30 hours a week, up to 60 hours a week on this car in addition to their schooling. And then we also have about 10, maybe like 8 to 10 understudies who spend 20 to 30 hours a week. So it's a really high time commitment. That's why we don't have very many members. Any other questions? Can you strike freshmen out? I, as in in the program or in driving? In the program. Yes. Um, most of our guys are started as freshmen. Will over there, electrical lead, is a freshman this year. And then Cody over there is a freshman. Cindy's a freshman. So, yeah. Sir? Uh, how much uh, manufacturing do you do on site and how much of it do you have to outsourced to different places? I would say it's probably about 90% of the parts that we have to make. That's not including, you know, bot parts. That's not total parts, but 90% of like our custom parts is made at K-State. You, you mentioned you run E85 and then he also mentioned 93 and 100. Is that alcohol percentage or is that octane? Well, so gasoline be octane, uh, E85, um, that would be ethanol percentage, right? So, yeah, so 80, 85% ethanol. Let's get these guys and gals a warm thank you.